First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. I'm always very happy to be back uh, in Israel, in my, where I find my native Mediterranean roots. So, yes, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, you, you notice, actually, there is a slight change in title. In fact, uh, what I wanted to do was mostly talk about uh, the uh, uh, shape dynamics, but then I sort of figured that perhaps it would be much better uh, with a little bit of a perspective of uh, talking about shape modeling first and uh, how, in fact, the, the shape dynamics sort of very naturally evolved and, and from uh, 3D modeling, uh, 3D shape modeling. And uh, this work uh, is actually wouldn't be done without my former students here, Awada, who's at University of Luxembourg, Baloch is at Siemens Research, Ben Hamza at Concordia University, uh, Yi at GE Research, and of course, as usual, uh, I thank my uh, sponsor, the, the US Air Force. So, uh, I will, uh, the map of my talk here will start with a, a brief motivation, and then I will go into uh, th the 3D modeling framework, what, what uh, you know, how, uh, at least how we view it and how it, we, we do it, how it's implemented. And then I'll uh, briefly describe also how we can use this, uh, uh, what I call the topogeometric uh, modeling of uh, 3D shapes for uh, object uh, uh, recognition. And then I will uh, uh, this describe, again, as I said, sort of a very natural uh, evolution of these uh, 3D shapes uh, to talk about uh, shape flow modeling, and uh, uh, which, of course, we apply to activity analysis uh, and uh, surveillance and things of, of that nature. And then uh, we'll talk about the generative uh, modeling of dynamics of shapes. Uh, to, to our knowledge, actually, this is sort of the, uh, the first attempt to, uh, to do such a generative modeling of, uh, of, of shapes. And then I will conclude with uh, some remarks. All right, so what are we talking about? In fact, why, uh, in fact, are we even uh, looking at 3D uh, shapes, which, again, typically evolved from uh, 2D shapes? Well, first of all, we were, were interested, very interested in classification of uh, objects. So how do we come up with uh, uh, a model that's amenable to statistical uh, classification of uh, targets? And then, of course, it, it's a natural uh, you know, framework for reducing uh, the, uh, you know, to, to reduce the impact of uh, like occlusion in 2D uh, analysis, 2D shape analysis. And then we will see, uh, in fact, that uh, this 3D uh, framework actually is a very nice framework in the sense where it provides this uh, just th t by turning the third dimension into time, it gives you the, uh, the modeling uh, or a possibility of modeling shape dynamics. And of course, the applications are many, from medical applications to narrative modeling to archiving, et cetera, et cetera. I think I would be uh, preaching to the choir for most of you here uh, who are... Uh... Now, just uh, uh, in relation to... Uh, Actually, quite a bit of work that's been done in, uh, in uh, first starting with uh, 2D, with shock graphs and uh, graph isomorphism, uh, uh, Kimia and Tenenbaum, and, and a whole slew of uh, researchers, Siddiqui and Zucker, Kimmel and uh, uh, Brookstein. In the medial axis arena, you have all these people, uh, Blum, uh, Blum uh, Damon, uh, Kimia, etc. In the, the most theoretic uh, framework, and I will describe actually a little bit more about this because that is, in fact, uh, the approach we're taking here. It was, uh, as far as I know, at least, uh, it was uh, first applied in vision by uh, Shinagawa uh, and al. Uh, in the mid-90s. And uh, it was taken up uh, later on by Edelsberner, and then a whole bunch of other people have uh, uh, followed, and uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. And uh, last but not least, uh, th this is a very, uh, very ongoing and very uh, promising hot topic 
actually quite a bit of it is here at the Technion under uh, uh, Kimmel's, uh, in the Kimmel's lab and, uh, and also the uh, Bronstein squared, uh, I call them the Bronstein brothers, Bronstein uh, squared. So there's a lot of uh, very good uh, work going on in that uh, arena. Now, how is that related to shape dynamics? Of course, uh, the dynamics have been actually looked at and also in, in the 2D uh, arena, the starting with, uh, in the early 90s, in fact, with uh, active contours uh, and a whole bunch of people also, Kirwan, uh, Terzopoulos, et cetera. And then the level set methods, which was in fact uh, turned into an industry and uh, I'd spend the whole hour if I, uh, you know, if I cited everybody here, but I'll cite here uh, Osher for uh, reference, and I also, I like to be alive when I leave here. Uh, then uh, sequences of shapes, this is more recent, and uh, this is uh, the Wiseman group, uh, actually uh, had a very nice paper in uh, 2005. In fact, uh, they also provided uh, the, uh, the, the uh, data for uh, a lot of the analysis that well, I will be describing here. And there were also some other, uh, some other works uh, that uh, followed. And uh, last here, the shape dynamics, uh, uh, there was, uh, of course, the French group led by Eunice and uh, Trouvé, which uh, had also had sort of the, the, uh, the, uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, deformorph deformorphisms, and, uh, and more recently, in fact, uh, uh, I believe about two months ago, I, dis I, I discovered that actually uh, the, the physicists have been looking at this over the last few years as well, and they call it shape dynamics, in fact, and, uh, uh, and it, it has to do with uh, a lot of uh, qu quantum and uh, uh, quantum effects, et cetera. All right. So what is our uh, viewpoint here? Our viewpoint basically is that uh, it goes back, uh, in fact, uh, to the 30s. Morse was a mathematician from Harvard in the 30s who pr proposed this idea of defining a function on any manifold, in fact, as long as, of course, it's, uh, uh, it's an, a nice, uh, uh, nice manifold. Uh, and uh, as long as you design this function nicely, that goes from your manifold to R, this function actually uh, can re reveal a lot of information about the manifold itself. Of course, here, uh, again, we, what I, I would like to, uh, 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 to remark that we're interested in arbitrary topology, uh, in uh, uh, objects of any uh, arbitrary topology. So th that is important. In other words, if there, is, there are holes, et cetera, we want to be able to uh, naturally capture them. So what is a Morse function? Again, uh, you know, subject to some technicalities. It had to be one-to-one. -one, it has to be non-degenerate, et cetera. Subject to some uh, technicalities, you define this, uh, what is called the height function. The height function is exactly what it says. In other words, for, to each point on the manifold, you associate its height, okay? And then uh, you, uh, you take that function, you analyze that function, you, you, you uh, uh, identify the topology of the underlying object that's under analysis, and uh, you, you find that uh, all the critical points basically define the topology of your object. Like here, for instance, this bifurcation will, be, uh, will, be co uh, will coincide with the critical point of this uh, height function, okay? So that's, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, like a, a two-minute introduction to uh, the Morse uh, theory. So how do we use this? Again, in words, how do we uh, do it? We, uh, by defining this height function, so we are able to extract this uh, skeletal, uh, skeletal topological graph of uh, the uh, 3D object. And then by looking at the level sets of this function that we define on uh, this uh, surface, we are able actually to capture the geometry, okay? So that's basically what I'm showing here. This is all the level sets, and the, the, you can capture the geometry as finely as you would like it to be. In other words, the, depending on how finely you sample that level, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, Morse function that you define on your surface, you can actually retrieve the geometry as well as, uh, as you, uh, you would wish. 
Now, the question, of course, now, I have this uh, topological graph, and I have this geometric information that I captured through this level set. How do I encode this information uh, born by the uh, level curves throughout uh, the, uh, the, the graph? And here, basically, what we're looking at, we, uh, so each, along each uh, uh, segment of the graph, you have a set of level, uh, of level curves. How do you capture basically that evolution along that, uh, that uh, uh, segment of the graph? You think of each level curve as basically a point on some manifold, some high dimensional manifold, and that's basically where all these curves will lie. And then the question, is, and you have a sequence of such, uh, of such curves, and the question is how do I capture the trajectory of that set of level curves on that manifold? We don't know the manifold, and that's the, uh, uh, typically the big uh, problem. But if we did, and we were able to model this, uh, uh, this uh, trajectory on, on the manifold, then it's a trivial problem. You just basically take the model of that curve along each uh, segment of your, each edge of your graph, and there you have your uh, annotated graph that captures both the topology through the skeletal graph as well as the, the geometry through these, uh, what I call, what I uh, de denote here as weights. So, that, and you can reconstruct it again, and this is a, basically a reconstructable uh, thing. Now, again, the, the, actually the first height function goes back to the 40s by a, a French mechanical engineer who, uh, who literally actually uh, defined this uh, height function. And, uh, and it was, as I, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, it was first used by uh, Shinagawa, and then Edelsberner, and then uh, a former student of mine uh, uh, basically uh, took it up from there. So what is the problem? The problem is that this thing, of course, is not pose invariant. If you took this, uh, for instance, this double torus and turned it on its, uh, on its uh, belly and took the height function and tried to model the way I just uh, described to you, you get a totally, different, a totally different story. And of course, for object recognition, that's not very good. OK, and then in uh, 2005, a former student of mine proposed this idea of this isotropic distance. In other words, you, put, you choose a reference point at the centroid, and then you measure the distance from the centroid to the surface. And indeed, you can show, you can prove that it is a Morse function, so it satisfies all the, uh, uh, the properties of, uh, of a Morse function, and it is, in fact, uh, pose invariant. It is a rotation invariant, and you can actually do a lot of very nice uh, analysis about it. What's its problem? The problem, it still requires this reference point, and, and uh, so there are, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't quite like that. And uh, in 2006, uh, uh, Hilaga and Shinagawa actually propose this, uh, what, it, what they call the integrated geodesic uh, distance. And uh, uh, it turns out, of course, you can uh, again show that it, indeed it is a Morse function. And that, uh, that it is, of course, be, since it's intrinsic to the surface, it is uh, invariant uh, to, uh, uh, to any transformation. And basically, the idea is very simple. At any given point, you pick the geodesic distance to all other points and integrate it. So now you replace the whole surface by, this by values of this integrated geodesic distance. And uh, what I show on the right is, in fact, that geodesic distance uh, evaluated uh, uh, on it. And of course, uh, you can actually analyze this thing, and they, they uh, did uh, uh, a nice analysis to actually compute the topology and everything, but they actually didn't go all the way, because all the way, what I meant by that, what I mean by that is, if you recall, I wanted to be able to actually model, fully model a, a surface, namely take the, you know, get the topology and model the geometry through this set of level curves. And in fact, if you took now level sets of that ge uh, integrated geodesic functions, you will get a set of level curves. You can show that. And then the, the next question, of course, is, again, how do I model uh, this uh, uh, set of level curves? And uh, right around that time, actually, uh, we discovered this uh, paper by uh, uh, Broomhead and Kirby, who actually g gave a constructive proof of the Whitney embedding theorem. Whitney embedding theorem, basically, 
in a nutshell, tell, says that if you have an n-dimensional manifold subject to some, to some uh, uh, properties, uh, you can actually always embed it in a 2n plus 1, uh, in Rn 2n plus 1. So for us, we have, a, remember what we have, we have this trajectory on, the, uh, on an n-dimensional manifold, and uh, it's one manifold, and we wanted, of course, to, what we like to do is to be able, Whitney says that you should be able to embed that curve, that one manifold, in R3. So that was basically the, and again, as I said, in, in, uh, in 2002, Broomhead and uh, Kirby provided this constructive proof, and I think uh, uh, Rich Berenuk actually mentioned this uh, in, in passing yesterday. So basically, the, the idea is you have uh, your, your, uh, your uh, trajectory in R R3 and uh, plus one, and then you take a whole bunch of secants and you, do, uh, and you uh, optimize over the, those uh, secants to get, and you can get, of course, an, uh, uh, an R3 curve. And you can do that to each, uh, again, along each segment of your topological graph. And at the end, you get what, the, what we refer to as squiggle graph. It's a squiggle graph. So now any uh, th the 3D shape of arbitrary topology, you can represent it by a set uh, uh, connected, uh, uh, of course, at, at, at all the uh, junction, junction points and everything, by a set of 3D curves. All right? And... Uh, now, how do you use this? Well, it turns out that actually you can use them. Uh, 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 again, this uh, appeared, I believe, in 2010, this paper. So the, the, the idea is to uh, exploit uh, the, uh, the curvature of your, uh, uh, of your curve as well as the binormal. And you can define these turning angles in terms of the curvature and, and uh, this tau. And you can uh, associate, actually, a distribution. It's called the von Mises distribution to these uh, uh, two uh, parameters. And uh, I, again, I'm, I'm going fast here because I'm not really, this is not really the, the, the crux of, of shape dynamics, but uh, you, I'll, I'll get to the point. So you can actually d define a Riemannian metric uh, on, on this and uh, do uh, classification of, uh, of uh, uh, 3D shapes. Fine. Now I'm getting to the, uh, to the uh, the real talk. So now, uh, basically, I have my, my, my shapes, and I do the same thing, but now my third dimension is actually time, OK? Well, it turns out that it wasn't so easy as we thought it, it was going to be because, uh, because of several problems, and I will get to them in, in a second. So the, uh, of course, again, to recall, these are all the, uh, in fact, we, we used it also on uh, medical imaging. And uh, so what, what is the problem? The problem, again, uh, uh, this is the pro uh, problem that was looked at, again, by the Wiseman uh, uh, folks uh, in 2005. And these are actually, this is their data. And uh, they look, they, they basically solve a Poisson equation to, uh, to look at all these, uh, uh, to, to look at all these activities. They have a, a whole bunch of activities, walking, jumping, bending, what have you. And then uh, the, uh, the way we look at, at this problem is you have a video sequence, you create a set of, uh, of shapes out of that video sequence. Again, you're trying to, to model it as, uh, as a trajectory, all right? But actually, there is another, uh, another addition uh, to, this, uh, to this problem because what we wanted to do is actually add, and I will show you, add this, uh, addi this uh, uh, additional feature of being able to have a generative model. In other words, I give you the model, you can actually synthesize and you can simulate any activity you like. So that is the, uh, uh, the problem. So how do we look at the problem? So we take any, in fact, any uh, sample path of, uh, uh, of an activity, we look at it as a, uh, just a realization of a stochastic process on, uh, uh, on this uh, curved uh, space. And of course, any given, then, any given activity is going to have, uh, uh, in fact, uh, one can, uh, uh, and this is nothing new uh, uh, from a stochastic analysis, you can show that basically uh, the, your process has to satisfy, or if it is a physical process and it lives on a manifold, then it satisfies a stochastic differential equation. 
And so that's the, uh, the idea. Now, the problem is, we, as, as I uh, mentioned earlier, we don't know what the manifold looks like. But in 2006, there was actually a very nice paper by uh, Srivastava, uh, Klaassen, and uh, Mio. They basically actually described this, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, manifold of all uh, closed curves, plain closed curves, and they defined it in terms of this uh, turning angle theta. And uh, they basically, they, they have the fact that it, it, is, uh, it is a closed curve, okay? And uh, it, it has, uh, it has uh, a unity, uh, a unity uh, length, and you can show, of course, uh, then they show, rather, uh, that, uh, that there is this uh, phi function that goes from an affine uh, space into R3. And uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, manifold, you can actually uh, uh, describe it by its tangent uh, uh, space that, that is described by one cosine. Theta is basically, again, is the shape that's described by this turning angle of your, uh, uh, of your shape. So you describe the whole uh, manifold that way, and you can actually do analysis after that. All right, so how do we uh, uh, solve our problem? So most people, uh, at least until uh, we uh, looked at this problem, most people uh, take all of these, uh, uh, th all of these points, they, uh, they, look at it, uh, they look at the shape manifold as a Riemannian manifold, and they basically, what they, they, they do is they, they uh, uh, they, they uh, uh, approximate. They approximate each point by its tangent space, and uh, they uh, and they take uh, and they take uh, uh, sort of any linear model after that. But it turns out that, of course, as long as as soon as you start straying away from this point, all bets are off. Your things are completely. Uh, your model is completely wrong, and it it uh, it it, uh, it fails. So. What, uh, what my student, uh, what, uh, f three, four years ago now, proposed is uh, actually what you should do is, uh, in, in fact, uh, take all of these points, transport them back to the, uh, to the initial point, and then the, and take that, uh, that tangent space and do a curve development at that uh, tangent space. That is a very accurate model of actually of your trajectory on your, uh, on your manifold. So that's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of details here because there's quite a bit of, uh, of details about how we actually do that using a uh, the theory of bundles and everything. So the core idea is actually very simple. The core idea, as I, I said earlier, is that you, you say, as I, I told you, your, uh, your process, in other words, your trajectory is basically is, uh, a stochastic, is described by a stochastic differential equation. And this is your vector field at, at each point, and these are the coefficients of your uh, uh, of your uh, differential equation. In other words, of your process. Your process is x t. That's the, the, that's your uh, uh, that's your trajectory, and uh, so you can uh, yeah, you can basically you uh, again as I said. So each point here is a one frame one. Uh, uh, in other words, the, the shape at each frame is each of these points. So you take these uh, and you, uh, you uh, approximate each point, of course, by its uh, tangent. Uh, in other words, you, you take its tangent uh, vector here, and you parallel transport it back. You do a flat connection. You transport it back to the uh, ori origin, and you do basically an integral. You have a set, uh, you know, now you, you, everything is in a flat space at the origin. You, d you have a set of coefficients. You, co you can do basically a time integral, and that is the, the, uh, what, what is referred to in stochastic analysis as a curve development. All right, so that's basically what uh, we do here, and that's the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the trajectory that, um, that, that, that you get for any given uh, process, for any given process or activity, in other words. And uh, here, what we show is actually a, an example, for instance, of a run. These are all the shapes. This is the curve development, in other words, all the coefficients. And you can use now these coefficients to do, because they actually capture that trajectory, that whole, that, the whole dynamics uh, uh, very accurately. 
and you can uh, you can do uh, uh, you know you can do any classification. In here, we, we did a very simple uh, you know very simple uh, uh, thing. We just looked at the uh, uh, co correlation. Actually, I have plenty of time. We look at the uh, correlation uh, uh, functions of of uh, the uh, of the each. If I have like two uh, two developments, you know, was two different. I have an observed, uh, an observed uh, activity, and I have a template activity. I have a model. I compare it through these uh, correlation uh, uh, functions, and I, I, I can uh, take an L2 distance on that, and I get, and I get uh, uh, this confusion matrix. So you notice, though, that uh, uh, so these are all the activities. Uh, so uh, waving uh, to bending, uh, the same thing here. Uh, but you notice that actually there are quite a few activities that, that are, uh, you know, that are, uh, that are confusing. In other words, we weren't able to, for instance, at least reproduce the performance that was uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the 2005 uh, paper uh, by the uh, Wiseman group. And what we discovered, in fact, uh, that uh, of course, if you take covariance matrices and all these things, the, the, uh, uh, you know, the implicit uh, assumption you're making is that your process is stationary. It turns out, of course, that it was highly non-stationary. In fact, uh, uh, every time, as it turned out, every time we, uh, you have uh, sort of uh, the uh, individual sort of crossing their... Uh, their uh, Not according to my clock here. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, you have a non-stationarity every time. Basically, you you change from uh, like a two-legged shape to a one-legged shape. So what we did is we did a, a piecewise stationary uh, process, and uh, we actually we uh, 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 modeled it as a Brownian motion. And in fact, uh, what you can do by doing that so is actually improve the performance quite a bit. And uh, in fact, you see here, uh, modulo this running, actually we were, uh, we were on par with, uh, 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 with the Poisson, the solution of a Poisson equation, of course, is a little bit of a difficult thing. All right, so now how do we actually uh, come up with a generative model? Well, first of all, we, we, uh, we need to reduce the dimension, obviously, because these curves live in a very high dimensional space and uh, they're uh, very complicated. And uh, of course, uh, there's all sorts of uh, uh, dimensional reduction. I will pass on that. And uh, the uh, heavy computation, et cetera, I will pass on that. But the, uh, the, uh, the, the idea here is we uh, describe, for instance, uh, the Whitney embedding uh, 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 idea. You can indeed get a very nice uh, uh, low complexity, a uh, three dimensional you know, space curve, basically, which is uh, fairly simple. But the only problem is we, we are not able we do not have an inverse to that uh, projection uh, operator for the uh, Whitney embedding. So what do we do, all right? What we do is we say, okay, actually, you know, this trajectory at each point also can be, uh, uh, can be tracked through it, uh, its uh, set of uh, Fernet frames. So you have basically, you have this uh, trajectory and you have a set of Fernet frames and that's basically what, what uh, we, we used in the end to, uh, to, be, able, to be able to actually uh, 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 model uh, this uh, and reduce the dimension of this, uh, of this process. So here, for instance, again, as I, we, I said earlier, you have all these tangent spaces. But now, associated to, his, uh, to each of these tangent spaces, I have a Fernet frame. I do the same thing. What I do is I parallel transport all of these Fernet frame back to the origin, okay? And now I have this uh, 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 very large, uh, uh, basically, uh, set of uh, frames, and I do a PCA. You, you, I'm back in the flat domain. I'm in a, in a tangent space. I'm back in the flat domain. I do a PCA, and in fact, uh, it turns out that by taking three eigenvectors, that was plenty to actually uh, to, to, in fact, it, it was, in, in the sense, consistent with the Whitney embedding theorem. It was uh, plenty to, uh, to uh, be able to uh, approximate the uh, trajectory. 
Okay, I'm going to pass on this. So uh, here is the, again uh, the idea. The idea is uh, I have now transported my, uh, all my process and the, the uh, Fernier frames back to the origin, and I do a, a, a principal component uh, analysis. And now I have uh, this uh, representation. It's the same as the, the stochastic differential equation representation, except I see here I'm, I'm showing it as an integral. So I have my, uh, my uh, this is my frame at each point, right? And, and uh, uh, again, uh, with, with the corresponding, of course, coefficients, and x0 being the, uh, the initial condition, okay? And what I do is I, I, I do a, a, a dimensional reduction at this point here, and uh, I, get, I get this tilde, this tilde being now my reduced it's a three, like, like I said, I, I take a three-dimensional uh, uh, frame uh, along with, of course, along with uh, uh, the corresponding coefficients. And uh, I, have my, uh, I have my representation. I can do now, I can, uh, I can transport back out these, uh, uh, these frames to get, I can transport back out these frames to, to get again the whole uh, uh, the whole trajectory if I wanted to, and uh, do a, a projection onto R three. Okay, so this is what I, I'm showing here. This is an embedding again. Uh, remember what we did here. The embedding was done first by uh, by taking a, a PCA approximation to the Fer the Fernier uh, uh, representation, the Fernier frame representation of the whole set of, of uh, shapes. And this is, for instance, uh, what, what, what I get as a 3D uh, uh, curve, and this is a 3D trajectory of uh, a running sequence here, okay? All right, and this is the reconstruction. And you can actually, uh, for those of you who are closer, perhaps it's easier to see, you can see that actually the uh, reconstruction is fairly, actually, fairly accurate. All right. Now, okay, here is uh, what, what we do now. What we do is uh, we, have, we have our, our uh, model. It's basically, it's, a, it's an, eigen, uh, an eigen model. We, and we have our initial uh, shape. All we do is basically apply that, transport it out, and actually synthesize, synthesize a whole, uh, a, a whole uh, activity. And this is what we do here, for instance. This is a running activity. This is synthesized through a, a, three, uh, a three eigenvector uh, realization. And uh, this is the, the, the trajectory it goes through. And we did this for the different, of course, uh, uh, different, uh, this is just the trajectory of uh, the 3D curve uh, that we synthesized. And then we, uh, just for kicks, we said, okay, what if actually, what if we, uh, uh, we, t we took, remember I, I, I told you that I had an initial shape. I had an initial condition shape that I started with, x0. What if I took, for instance, a circle and initiated and, uh, and used the model of any activity and, uh, and tried to run it and see what, what it gives me? This is what it gives me. It actually, as you can see at the beginning, it actually tries to, uh, uh, to uh, follow the, uh, the uh, sort of the human, uh, uh, the, the human shape, and that basically it breaks down, particularly here, where the, the curve no longer is not even simple anymore, as we had started with as a model, and, and uh, it breaks down. Same thing here, we started, for instance, we started with, uh, with a square, absolutely failed, okay? So, you know, at least uh, it's not, it, this is not, uh, uh, it's not counter, uh, counter our own uh, intuition. These are just uh, other, uh, uh, other types of, uh, uh, other types of uh, uh, reconstructions and uh, modeling for hand waving, for instance, and uh, walking. And then we uh, thought, okay, so if this is true, if this is truly, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nice, uh, accurate uh, 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 prediction, 
What if I took, for instance, a shape, I started with a shape, I evolved it on the manifold through a geodesic path, okay? And in fact, what we did is we created a triangle of, of pa a triangular path, a, a triangular geodesic path with the shapes, and then projected it onto, uh, the, uh, onto R3. And this is what we get. So modulo, for instance, the end point, the uh, starting point, and the end point, what you see is actually quite, uh, uh, quite again, nicely consistent with what you would expect at the very least. Excellent. Then uh, we, uh, we said, okay, remember what we did, uh, uh, what we had done earlier, namely what we did with the, the, uh, uh, the Whitney embedding. Same thing, we took a geodesic, uh, uh, geodesic path and, and uh, uh, did a Whitney embedding projection here. And here, uh, again, this is, uh, uh, this is what uh, the, the, uh, the eigen, the PCA-based uh, uh, embedding that I just described. You see that actually, and uh, we, we, you know, this is not quite that surprising by the fact that the Whitney actually does not, because it is not, uh, it does not actually, the, the way it is implemented and the way it was constructed, it wasn't trying to, uh, to uh, 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 preserve uh, the, uh, the L2 distance as uh, had been done. Here we just uh, uh, basically looked at the performance, in other words, now using, using uh, the reduced dimension uh, for uh, recognition. And uh, of course, again, here, it's maybe these are not fair in the sense where uh, PCA, I mean, you, you're doing PCA on, on uh, data that doesn't live in, uh, uh, in a flat space. So it sort of explains why, uh, you know, why some of these um, some of these results are not so uh, uh, so brilliant? In fact, uh, do I have two minutes? Yeah, uh, very very quickly. So in fact, uh, we can use also this uh, uh, this uh, setup to actually uh, do tracking, uh, shape uh, tracking, and uh, uh, you can actually define a common filter with this uh, uh, an extended common filter with this uh, uh, framework, that is, this analysis framework. And I'm going to pass this. And uh, this is, uh, these are some of the, uh, uh, the results that we get, again, on uh, the same, the same uh, uh, set of uh, data. We actually also tried it on uh, the Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon has uh, more recently uh, published also a database uh, along uh, these uh, 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 you know, along this theme here, and uh, we've uh, we've also checked it out uh, there, and uh, things actually were consistent. So, in conclusion, what uh, have we done here? So, we we're basically again we have uh, uh, exploited our shape modeling, the 3D shape modeling, to actually extend it into a dynamic uh, shape modeling, and uh, uh, we've uh, used it, of course, uh, for activity uh, uh, cl classification and modeling dimension uh, reduction for shape processes, and uh, we were able also to actually come up with uh, sort of uh, a rigorous and, and, uh, and nice way of, of tracking uh, shapes uh, across uh, video sequences. And that's basically all I have. Thank you.